Christmas and the problem of innate knowledge. Is there a nexus between the story of the birth of Jesus and the problem of knowledge, the problem of philosophy? The nexus is unequivocally signaled by the presence of the three wise men, or the magi, um, who in Aristotelian language we could call the natural philosophers. These are men of knowledge. They seek knowledge, they acquire knowledge of the heavens. Why? Because they assume that truth is in the heavens, that truth is beyond the realm of human conventions, that the acquisition of knowledge takes us further and further away from the realm of human conventions, and thus from ignorance. The story of the birth of Jesus tells us otherwise. It tells us that natural knowledge, or shall we say, uh, the, the knowledge of natural philosophers, acquired knowledge, this is the point, takes us at some point by an unexpected turn. It takes us back to the realm of men. In Platonic terms, the ideas that were sought in the heavens are rediscovered within the human. The discovery of truth within the human restores the legitimacy of natural philosophy, of acquired knowledge. Why are the three wise men kings? Why are these natural philosophers kings? They are kings because they do not seek to acquire knowledge merely in pedestrian um, terms as an instrument. You cannot use the stars. You can use a hammer. You can use all kinds of artifacts. Everything that is down among us, that, that is in reach, but not stars. Stars, heavenly bodies, for the classical world, are unreachable in practical terms. They are object of contemplation. You can reach them with your mind, shall we say, in thought, in the element of thought. And so these wise men are superior with respect to people who seek knowledge of food, of weapons, of um, materials that are ready at hand and that we can um, collect and gather to build things. You can't build anything with the stars. So there are kings, kings among other men who seek to acquire specific kinds of knowledge. The ruling acquired knowledge is the knowledge that is above all um, all building, all appropriation for mortal ends. So it is immortal knowledge. It is knowledge of eternal things that cannot be used. They're always there, and they're a point of reference, just as a North Star is a point of reference uh, for lower types of acquired knowledge. And yet, this knowledge that is supposed to be king, or for kings, is not ultimate. It points back to, the forms of this knowledge point back to the human, or what is essential within the human. And indeed, the Christians will speak of uh, the first Adam as Jesus. So the, what is absolutely essential 
about the human, and that turns out to be something that is at once human and divine. Now, if truth is to be sought at the root of the human, then knowledge is no longer to be understood primarily as an acquisition, but as something that is presupposed by all acquisitions of knowledge. In other words, what we could call an innate knowledge, innate knowledge. At the beginning of the modern world, we have references to the distinction between, we could say, empirical knowledge, which is acquired knowledge um, in modern terms, and innate knowledge, what is uh, a priori, a priori, in the terms of modern, early modern philosophers. But for them, for these philosophers, for these early modern philosophers, what is a priori, in other words, what is presupposed, the knowledge that is presupposed by acquired knowledge, is merely formal. It pertains to structures of knowledge, concepts that allow us to pursue, um, well, natural philosophy, ultimately. Uh, which is to say that to acquire knowledge that distances, distances us from the foundations. Now, the modern philosopher will help us gain clear and distinct ideas that are obscured by our birth. We are born in a condition of ignorance, confused, the we start acquiring knowledge, and then the modern philosopher says, well, let's turn back to our state of nature, what he calls the state of nature, the modern philosophy, and see in there structures that allow us to acquire knowledge. This is not the lesson that we learn in Christianity, and indeed in classical philosophy and especially in a philosophy that is compatible with the message of the Gospels. What do we learn there? There we learn that there is indeed more, much more than merely formal structures that we can um, conceptualize at the heart of our well, birth, of our state of nature. We are born in a state of ignorance. And then what do we do? We try to acquire knowledge by way of concealing, covering up our ignorance. We learn words. With these words, we build up a world of conventions. These conventions conceal our ignorance, but at the same time, point beyond it. beyond it um, in a way that they can illuminate and even redeem our ignorance. Let us see what this means. The world of conventions in the classical world, um, the, the realm of conventions, is always pointing to another world. In this other world, our ignorance is finally to be redeemed. What happens in the modern world? There's no reference to the other world, if not as a matter of speech. And in any case, where the other world is functional to um, secular progress. What we have is acquired knowledge that departs from and builds on our ignorance.
Once again, this is not compatible with the message of the Gospels. So, let us focus here on the alternative that is presented to us by the Gospels. Truth is at the heart of the human. This is to say that all acquired knowledge ultimately, and this is through the kings, these are the best of the natural philosophers, and thus of those who acquire knowledge, points back to a truth that is within the human. This truth is born in the midst of ignorance among shepherds. In a dark world, at night, and it invites knowledge, but not a knowledge that you acquire. It invites reflection upon a knowledge that is not merely formal, that is one with being. It's living knowledge. It is knowledge as a property of being, an original property, an innate property of being, not as something that is added to being, but something that originally belongs to being, our being. So that our own being would be in need of being rediscovered, rediscovered as something that possesses knowledge. And what is it? What is that being that possesses knowledge? Or rather, um, that is endowed with the possession of its own principles of truth. A being that possesses truth would be, in classical terms, mind. St. Paul in Romans uh, refers to his doing things that um, he does not want to do. And this because of the law of the flesh, because he is in a fallen world. But according to the law of the mind, following the law of the mind, um, he, he doesn't want to do those things. In other words, the law of the mind is fine. The problem is the law of the flesh. We're in a fallen condition. If we follow the law of the flesh, um, we're lost. We can try to build on it and uh, overcome it by acquisition, but that won't work. We would need to return to the law of the mind and thus to a being that is not originally um, devoid of knowledge. Yeah? This is the challenge. Returning to a being that is not, as it is, devoid of knowledge. That is a living being, a living knowledge is what is at stake. And how do we go about returning to this living knowledge? The return to living knowledge can have acquire knowledge as a preface, but ultimately it is a task in its own right. It is a fundamental task that happens to coincide with um, a, a special kind of philosophy, which in classical terms is called Platonic philosophy. 
and Platonic philosophy is a reflective philosophy that does not seek any what we would call objective conclusion uh, that we can acquire and that can cover up our ignorance, overcome our ignorance, if only one step at a time. What is at stake here is the exposition, in fact, the purgation of our ignorance in the light of a, a being and a knowledge that it presupposes. We could say that there is a light in the dark and we would need to return to this light. Again, not as a formula that settles the problem of, not, of, of ignorance once and for all, but one that al allows us to confront ignorance without being overcome by it to live in ignorance without departing from it, to carry our cross um, throughout our life without caving in, without compromising, without accepting the law of the flesh as the supreme one, and thus without falling into despair. And so the story of the birth of Jesus is a story of hope. It is a story of hope primarily because it shows that um, the, the justification for, in fact, what allows us to endure our suffering is not something that is um, subject to conditions, external conditions, it is not something that is contingent upon what is beyond ourselves. It is innate. What allows us to carry our cross is a light shining in the dark. It is a positive foundation for all acquired knowledge. By positive, here we mean um, substantive, um, alive, uh, not merely formal. There is divinity, in uh, other words, at the heart of the human. And now, does this mean that we are to abandon acquired knowledge? No, of course not, no more than um, the law of conventions. Um, so, what are we to do? We are to see the acquired knowledge in the light of a presupposed knowledge. It's the importance of a return. The return is going to redeem the advance, the progress. No progress is worthwhile having if we do not first return to the foundations and live in them as our proper home. And so if there is to be a progress, let it be in the light of a presupposed knowledge, a presupposed possession of truth. In what way do we possess a truth that we already have? that we ourselves presuppose as conscious, conscious beings, beings who acquire a sense of certainty throughout their lives. This is a knowledge that involves, that we return to um, through letting go, letting go of our own sense of certainty, and thus of everything that we have acquired from birth. Returning to Christmas involves a return to um, a condition where we have not yet acquired anything that might obscure, eclipse, cover up, 
innate knowledge, the light that shines in the dark. A return to Christmas and a celebration of Christmas would involve a letting go of everything that we have acquired, letting go of all of our possessions. First and foremost, our own sense of certainty. Letting go. We could say even falling into the waters of death. To witness and to be exposed to, primarily, a birth. The birth of the eternal within fallen things, a fallen condition. The birth of the eternal, which is to say the shining forth of intelligent being in the midst of ignorant being, fallen being. So, a celebration of Christmas is really a return to um, a divine that restores all that is human, all that is going to um, tend toward acquisition. It restores our acquisitions by bringing them back to their foundation. Our whole lives will be a celebration of that light that shines in the dark.